Good morning again. It's uh, three consulting amigos with uh, number four sitting in today, John Mills. Thanks very much for uh, everybody showing up today, and and uh, we're happy we're happy to f go through this fourth in a series, which is on family businesses. Uh, this will be the last one, um, unless we come up with something that we've forgotten, I suppose, in the future. But this particular day, we're going to talk about skills. Uh, last week, we talked about getting to the point to where you need to do some skills training, and uh, it's a big subject, so we thought we would um, uh, finish up with that. Uh, this one of the things that owners need to do is to figure out how to continue on with skills. So I've got a very sort of a, a, a quick set, uh, a quick presentation. I'll kind of start us off, and then we'll talk talk through that just a little bit. Um, uh, okay. So uh, this is really acquiring skills. We know everybody can't be everything to everybody else all the time. And um, small business people who tend to have certain kinds of personalities tend, tend to not have some of the skills, that don't have the personality that would enjoy the skills to do some of the, some of the more detailed ongoing things like administration, office work, that sort of thing. Typically, as we've talked about before, that's because uh, the entrepreneur tends to have a little bit more vision, um, has an idea, wants a market that, uh, that a problem in a market that he can solve. And, and many times they have the skills to be able to deliver that product, but not necessarily some of the management things. And so you got to kind of build up to that, add those. Uh, so we thought that's what we'll be talking about today. So um, many family businesses tend uh, tend to not to do, so that's, you know, that's a big faux pas, uh, spell or miss that, not do as well as professionally run companies. And that's the premise that, we're, that we've kind of built this whole thing around. So what, by way of very, very brief um, kind of positioning, we've been through these, uh, but these are some of the reasons families, Family dynamics are not really controlled. These are some of the problems. Meritocracy is overlooked on behalf of family members. We've discussed that one as well. Uh, by the way, you'll be able to go back you know, at the at the very end slide. You'll you'll be able to go back and click on a couple of these previous ones to to look at them as well. Uh, management, ownership, and the, and jobs overlap. Um, so you've got several family members who are involved, and sometimes they don't really understand what their role is, and that in, ends up being being a problem. The founders' personalities are different, uh, as I mentioned before, than, say, a sustainable business, which tends to be more attention to detail. And then finally, uh, as we kind of finished up last week, it's, skill development is not really intentional or comprehensive. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's not as though a, the owner of a business doesn't recognize that one of his people needs to kind of up his game a little bit or that he doesn't know enough about accounting um, and he can't read his financial statements. You know, it's not as though they don't understand that. Um, and it's also not as though they don't um, uh, go go do things, uh, get some training, get some bring in some people from outside to really help with that problem, but they don't tend to do a training program in an intentional or comprehensive way. So um, I kind of went through and just threw out a bunch of the things that we have been talking about over these last three sessions. Um, and I'm not going to go through, we're not going to talk about each and every one of these, but basically they fall into three categories. It seems to me you've got a, a whole group of management skills, a whole group of marketing skills, and then of course the craft skills, um, the specialty knowledge and information to be able to manufacture your specific um, um, skill set, whether it would be in you know plastics or ceramics or glass or whatever. Um, or, or your ability to be able to do a service like plumbing, um, HVAC, um, but whatever it is, typically the owner brings those skills, and so that's kind of like taken care of, but then it's got to be translated into a process, 
uh, that can be replicated by other employees or manufacturing needs to be set up or um, the pr processes program programming needs to happen to keep everybody you know delivering that product and service in the way that the that the founder really intended and probably do, has done him him or herself we won't really talk uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that but there's a, there are so many of them, I, I didn't take the time to, to list a whole bunch of them because, uh, you know, we'd spend the rest of our, of our time just talking about all the different skills. There's, you know, there are millions of different skills required to be able to do all these millions of products and services that are delivered to customers every day. But we did something fun. And in, uh, and that is that the, the the four of us uh, kind of did input on our own to say, well, what are the top five five issues in terms of doing skills development? What do we really do there? And how do we really do that? So I've put these slides together just as a way to kind of prioritize how they came out. So you guys haven't seen these. So <clears throat> I hope they don't look too foreign to you. Um, but I've, I've tried to really, really bring them down um, because some of them, particularly yours, Ed, were very, very specific and long. So it was kind of hard to get them in a little box like this. And, <laughs> so, yeah, story of my uh, life. <laughs> so, um, and then I rated them based on um, how we rated them and how, of course, how I felt like they fit together because the the text is different in, in each case. So on the top were two of them, finance and capital. And by finance, it's, that includes you know knowledge of finance, banking, um, uh, accounting, ca you know capital usage, borrowing, the care and feeding of your banker. You know that that whole group of of sort of numbers that um, many entrepreneurs know a little bit about. But they don't when you when you get a little bit bigger business, many of them fall short there and you know they they you know they tend to catch up, but the bigger the business, the more sophisticated the the requirements are. Um, and then that uh, next to creativity, which is is really a short word for a wide range of sort of attitudes. Um, uh, we've talked about the personality factor open to change, for instance. Um, that leads to creativity, and um, uh, that that's a kind of a broad range of innovation and um, making things happen. And entrepreneurs tend to be pretty good in that. Um, and then the next level down, sort of number two, there were three that kind of tied for number two: uh, craft experience, which I just touch, touched on, um, and organizational. Um, capabilities or uh, organizational behavior, meaning HR is involved in that, um, team building is involved in that, sort of a whole kind of a genre of um, keeping everything organized, lines of communication open, that sort of thing, and then attention to detail. Now, attention to detail is also sort of a, a personality kind of thing. Um, and then even keel management. So this is really combining a couple of things. <clears throat> Ed suggested that being a manager should have an even keel. In other words, expectations need to be consistent. Um, and then that whole ability to, to do that kind of management and do the hiring and so forth is all kind of part of that. Um, the interesting thing is that when we take a look at these, there are three of them that I think, and you guys speak up if you disagree, I think these are personality traits. In other words, um, it's possible for many uh, entrepreneurs to sit down and go through columns and columns and columns of numbers and categorization and analysis and that kind of thing, but a lot of entrepreneurs don't like it. And a lot of them miss the detail because they, they sort of get bored with it. Uh, or maybe they don't understand understand exactly how to do it, but they have to do it and they do it. But we find that people that have certain personalities um, have a have a love of this level of detail, 
and those are the ones that really make the the great the great accountants for instance um and uh and this management kind of idea and we've spoken of this before is that you can learn management techniques uh ray teaches management techniques and uh john has done a little bit of that as well um i've tried to do some of that but i've but I also try to keep out of that. To me, that's a little little bit sticky. I want to kind of stay stay in in my sort of strategy and marketing area many times. So um, what I thought we would do is kind of focus on well, some of these things. You know, good managements I believe are born. And now a lot of management uh, leadership people dis disagree with that. Um, but let's get into this a little bit and kind of talk about that um, well, let me open let me open up with that seeing okay. i'm i'm not going to be here for the entire program but i'm gonna i'm gonna agree with you that there are some things that we are inherently born with and we have a natural uh, affinity for that but that is not to say that you cannot over time learn a skill or learn to uh, damp that particular tendency down and become even keel. For example, if you are curious and you're open to change, you may decide over time that you have to go and put that on, not on hold, but you need to damp it down because you do need to then uh, have attention to detail and you do need to have an even keel management style for the good of the order. And you can learn how to do that. However, there's the problem is that there's a tension in doing that. And that does cause some degree of anxiety or stress because you're operating out of your base. So then what happens is you learn how to go and adapt your, your basic style, and you can do that for a long period of time. But in the case of high stress, inevitably, you default to whatever your core mm -hmm. uh, nature is. And so mm -hmm. that's where things break apart is typically under extreme stress. Right. That's when the – and so that would be my, my cover for that. No, I, I, I completely agree with that. And then, and I would just sort of add that it's not that you cannot learn management techniques. It's that you don't really like to do those. That's not who you are. Trying to keep an emotional person at an even keel in a management situation when there's a lot of stress pretty tough to do if you don't if you don't have that natural ability to stay calm. Um, it, it's, it's tough to do. Ray, you've done you've done a lot of work um, uh, with your leadership programs. You have any comments to to add in on 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 this personality driven versus learned skills? Uh, did we lose um, Ray? No, no. I I just had myself on mute. So oh, okay. Um, but yes, uh, I agree with uh, John. I think you know our natural tendencies are are pretty much uh prescribed at birth you know we have certain tendencies but as john said you know in you know it, to become effective as a leader you have to learn how to adapt those things so you know if you have a tendency to become um emotional uh at the drop of a hat you know that becomes a challenge inside of an organization and we've all been there when we've seen you know leaders who are very emotional and can disrupt their their companies uh, by virtue of uh, you know going off the deep end or whatever having yeah. said that uh, my experience has been that you know effective leaders learn how to manage that and it, they adapt their behavior uh, as, as john pointed out though when when serious stress happens they always default back to whatever it is that their base um, nature is so you know, it's just a matter of being able to function in 90% of the cases as effectively as possible, given what their natural tendencies are. Yeah, right. Well, well said. And you and I, Ray, have, have had the, the pleasure of working uh, with one of these guys who um, most of his days were highly emotional and stressful. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've we've kind of been through the gauntlet on on that side. Of the thing. Um, yeah. And so if we if we kind of then consider, um, well, where do we go from here? Um, you know, the, the learning organization has become something to of, uh, well, I mean, a, a, a common a common sort of business subject. And, you know, when you have a really big company, how do you do how do you 
do that. That's really kind of like an, another whole effort. Um, and, but some companies have become, we have always been learning companies and they tend to be the high tech people. You know, they get these really creative, highly, highly specialized people working on certain kinds of problems and have come up with some amazing things as we, we all know and understand. But sort of the challenge here is we bring this back down to the independent business, the family business, um, where you've got people who are maybe in positions that they really shouldn't have that other employees maybe are better at. How do you turn your organization into a learning organization so that these skills can be attained? And so um, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot, Ray. Um, I've thrown up several programs. I don't think I've you know, gotten the whole the whole bit, but um, you've had a lot of experience, uh, more than the rest of us, on some of these particular projects. Can you walk us through some of these and maybe add uh, add some additional ones that I've missed here? Well, yeah, and I think uh, the the initial one, the employment training panel, uh, is simply a funding mechanism. You know, um, and not all organizations are eligible, for, but those who are. Um, this becomes a powerful way for them to be able to fund training when sometimes training is not done simply because there's no mechanism to pay for it. And, uh, you know, it becomes a challenge when people are asked to come off the front line to be able to do training. And it's, um, and it's a major issue. And as I've worked on it, I've found that there are certain things that work better if you're doing workforce development using ETP or any other model. And that is to keep it to less than an hour a week uh, because if it gets longer than that, you're going to have an operations manager like Ed, as he used to be, you know, complaining about the fact, hey, look, you're taking my my talent away. I can't I can't function in this. So you, you know, you have to create a mechanism for training that complements the business's operational uh, requirements as well. Um, OJT, you know, that's that's a common way of being able to develop skills normally of frontline workers, but I see there's some merit in being able to develop leadership in the same way, you know, invite them to go to other positions so they learn, you know, they go from marketing to operations or advertising or whatever that might be. So they become more um, adept at being able to manage, you know, the full scope of the business because ultimately, you know, what we've talked about here is the owner needs to step away from the business and make sure that it runs without him. And that's one way of doing it. Community colleges, always a good source for training and development. Uh, and then as you pointed out on the bottom here, there are so many mechanisms for everyone to learn from. Um, but I see too many times that there's really not a structure. I've had a couple of organizations that literally would walk through, the entire organization would walk through a book, um, which really helped everybody get involved. So. Um, I've learned from several of these things, uh, good le learning organizations tend to uh, be more profitable and grow more rapidly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, so um, just a couple of things to, to sort of overlap and then we'll open it, open it up here. Um, you, you need to determine, as Ray kind of mentioned, you need to kind of know what you're good at. Uh, and to do that, you need to understand what your job descriptions are, what all of the functions of the business are. We listed so many functions there in that earlier slide. Um, and then you have to be able to evaluate those jobs against the, the people who are in those. So, you know, we, we have found that that very few small organizations have good job descriptions, number yeah. one. And number two, very few of them actually do a decent job of evaluating a person uh, within that particular job. So, you know, looking at good, good descriptions and then more than that, better evaluations helps you identify where you have skill shortages. And then you can use those skill shortages to develop a program um, with someone like Ray on ETP. Uh, many of the community colleges have ETP programs in California. Uh, that's really federal federal money, though, uh, isn't it, Ray? And the states the states control it, but it really is federal. I think all the states have some for, sort of an ETP program, right? Well, no, uh, not every state, but but you're right. I mean, the money that uh, can be used for this training typically comes from the federal government. So if you have the employment training panel to kind of help offset the cost, it makes it 
it, it enables you to develop your uh, workforce talent and skills without, you know, dipping deeply into your own um, limited budgets, you know, and yeah. as we've talked about, you know, that's, that's always an area for um, companies to struggle, you know, how do I pay for this? Yeah, exactly. And so developing an ongoing program of skills upgrading uh, really is, you know, I think that's an important part of getting your business beyond yourself and then develop a learning attitude by the whole company as we talked about a learning company and funding it. Ray, Ray talked about funding. There are cheap programs at the community college level and many, many other opportunities uh, to, to be able to find funding to do this. But I would suggest also that many times it's not really funding, it's organization within the business. Um, and then, of course, periodically you, you, you want to review that whole, that whole thing uh, to make sure that your program is, is really effective. Um, so um, we haven't heard from Ed. Let's uh, kind of summarize all of this stuff for us, Ed. How, do, how does a small business um, get themselves organized enough to be able to take advantage of these programs? Well, I, I think they have to have a purpose. And I think that's one of the things we haven't talked about today. And that is somewhat of a strategic plan in mind as to where you're going. I, I think a lot of family businesses focus on today. What's going on today? How do I sur survive today? How do I handle customers today? But very few look into the future. So there's no financial roadmap that they can follow um, to get everybody on board to find out what they need to do to become more profitable and reduce risk. To me, that strategic vision helps define the missing links in your capabilities and what type of people you need to bring in, um, what type of training you need to have to take advantage of these types of opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good, great. Ed, if you can, you know, could you speak a little bit about your experience? Because, you know, of all of us, you've probably had more operational, direct operational control and experience. Um, when you were in that role, what did you do to kind of develop the skills of people who are underneath you? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with leveraging your skilled people in let's say in operations, they're doing something, they're, they're making, it's a craft like Ron indicates. So the better you get at that craft, the better you perform and the higher the quality. So you have to have some type of uh, on the job training for people so that they, they can learn these skills. And a lot of times the people that have the skills, they don't want to tell people how they do things. <laughs> they want to hide them because that's their job security. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you have to really keep it focused. So, you know, you have group incentives that really work because uh, for them to get an incentive, they have to work together and they have to train one another. And some people are really, really take this very seriously and they and and they see the value of it and, and they like being called a prof professional trainer or uh, some a go-to person that can help others uh, perform more effectively. So it's really hard to beat on the job training. But again, um, uh, you, you could be training for jobs that don't won't exist uh, three or four years down the road unless you have some type of strategic vision as to the skills that you're missing that you don't have that can make everybody right. more productive. So and, yeah, yeah, that's that's the game changer to me is uh, how to multiply uh, that, uh, that uh, intellectual knowledge in the company uh, to where you're going rather than where you've been. Right, right. And that leads us kind of to a, just an example uh, that, that we've all worked on. And, and that is if you've, if you've got a little factory and you, you know your labor costs are going up and you can't even hire people today, and we've had programs about that, um, you know, the natural tendency is, that, well, we're going to have to buy some machinery to see if we can make this more efficient, et cetera. And so, and then you get into the whole robotics discussion. And, and now the question is, well, have you got the team who can do that? Um, so if you, if you make a strategic decision, to your point, Ed, that we are going to um, increase our efficiency through automation and we're going to give ourselves a five or seven year kind of window to do that, then the plan ought to begin to have some tactics in there like, 
we got to get the people who know how to do this. And is that a full time job? Is that an outside job? You know, exactly how are we going to accomplish this? Because most organizations have to do a lot of learning if they're going to keep up with on the automation side. I mean, they've got their yeah. niche. They know what they're doing. They know the specifics of how to get the product uh, done and, and out to the door and to the customer. But do they know how to automate that process? And I'd suggest that most companies need outside help. So you well, got to plan for that. Yeah, and if I can add to that, Ron, I think that's one of the uh, issues that we've talked about a lot is that, you know, uh, the more effective the leader is, the more he understands the need for outside services. As an example, you were talking about automation. I mean, there's literally nobody inside his organization who possesses that particular skill. Yep, so right. when he brings in people from the outside to cross-train the people on the inside, you know, it won't happen. So, you know, part of what we've talked about is that, um going along with what Ed said, you know, having a strategic plan is critical to being able to do this. And what we know from experience, as he said, you know, most small businesses, you know, all they, they operate from the seat of the pants and what do I need today? Um, and so, you know, part of what we're trying to do is help them understand if they can, if they can kind of think in advance, they can prepare themselves for disruptions just like, uh, you know, Ed's former business, the newspaper industry uh, went through an enormous disruption when it was, you know, not necessarily expected. And, yeah. you know, people have to, you have to adjust. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, I think that's kind of an, an interesting way for us to sort of end up here. And that is that we come full circle. Um, you know, you go through and you say, well, you, you need to be a learning organization, but in order to be a learning organization, you've got to have a strategic plan. <laughs> Right. And so, and so that um, I have to say, I'm a little surprised. We, I'm surprised it really kind of came back to this, and that's of course the value of us getting together to have these have these really chats, and that kind of yeah. brings us like to another place, and that is, um, you know, we we kind of started these programs, you know, a couple of years ago, Ed, with your eight drivers to increase profitability, but uh, the eight drivers increase value in the in the in the business. Um, those eight drivers really also lead us to to the strategic plan uh, and kind of how to get to some of these places regarding training. You have any you want to bring those up or do you, yeah, any comments I, I on those? Wanna, drivers? I just like to say about the strategic plan and the eight drivers and all that. It's it's a and forecasting into the future. It's it's something that adds value to the company down the road. And it keeps everybody in the organization on the same page. They know what to focus on. You can measure what's accomplished so you know whether or not you're being successful. And it keeps everybody on the clock. They have to be held accountable for what they're supposed to do. I, I find it really hard not to be able uh, to, to run a company, to be able to run a company without some type of strategic vision that everybody can go back to every week and uh, recalibrate their thinking and make sure they're all on the same page. Otherwise, you have mass chaos. And that's where you run into problems where people are talking around their water cooler about, oh, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. And, uh, and, and maybe I should find another job. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. And it's, it's really important. And, and that's where outside help can really be beneficial to a company. Yeah, absolutely right. I'm, I'm uh, working with an organization right now um, that uh, at the board board meeting, there, there, there's a, a very dynamic, um, creative, young, inexperienced executive director who's just been doing some unbelievable work. I mean, just really phenomenal. But the guy is just on a, on a, you know, four or five mile an hour treadmill. I mean, the guy is going, 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 going. And he came up with some giant, giant projects to um, take advantage of, of some, some of the funds that are starting to show up because of all the spending we've been doing at the federal level. And, you know, because they had to, they had to get you know, returned fast. I mean, he wrote, he wrote the proposal in three or four days and submitted it without the board even knowing. Well, if, if this proposal were adopted, we would have like a very different organization because the revenue is six or seven times higher than the, than the current revenue. Yeah. 
And so um, that's just going to turn everything upside down. It's like, well, where did that come from? Well, it came because the strategic plan for the year hasn't been done yet. And that's going to be next next month. But, you know, he got ahead of it. And then three or four other things that came up and the board was just like taken aback. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. I mean, we didn't tell you to go do that. So you've got good people that need to be directed in small organizations. You have so many of these creative types and they're open to change and they want to try something new. And, you know, and if you can't keep them, you know, on the right train track and get them to do their switching, you know, at the right time to switch tracks, boy, you end up with a mess. And so then that's kind of where we're at now. So now I've got an emergency board meeting and it's, and of course we've all been there before. We've all been through this and why it happens over and over again, all the time. It's like nothing's really new in the non-planning um, area. <laughs> oh, Ray, you're, you need to unmute yourself. I was going to add, you know, one of the one of the dynamics of, you know, when you understand the personality traits, whether it's a 16 PF or the disc, you know, it just gives you an overview of how people are different and how to complement their skills and stuff. And what we know from the disc model is that people who are D's and I's are really creative and have very little focus and, you know, come up with new ideas every day. And then on the bottom, you have people who are doers, you know, just let me do my job. Please don't change anything because it's really a problem for me. And complimenting those, you know, is really important because if you let the, the bottom half decide on what's happening, they'd never change anything. And if you let the top half decide, they'd be changing everything every day. <laughs> yeah, well, that, you're, you're exactly right about that. And, and so when we apply that to the skill of management, um, yeah. there are, I, I mean, it, it, takes, it takes us a long time to be able to be good managers, except for the few that have that natural ability. Um, and those that have the natural ability many times are, are not really that open to change. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting problem, but I think that for the, the decision maker, the, you know, the president or the founder, the owner, um, to, to be able to attain the knowledge about how to direct their employees in, in, through hiring and so forth is a real opportunity to improve a business. And I don't think very many, um, very many of, of employers, very many owners really focus on that. You know, it's like HR is the department that you try to put, you know, in a hole somewhere. And, you know, they, because of regulation, if you are so fortunate to have a, you know, a dedicated person, it's usually that they're so busy handling issues for regulation, they can't really do the training part of, of HR. And so right. it ends up being a real mess. And then somebody's got to do HR. And so in smaller companies, it ends up being maybe the owner, maybe the bookkeeper, mm -hmm. um, maybe the owner's wife or husband, whatever. And so you end up with people who don't care, know that it's a, it's a, you have a fiduciary responsibility to do certain things. But the whole idea of teams and management and bringing people along ends up being about third or fourth on the HR person's list. And it yeah. just doesn't happen. Well, and I think that the point you're making, and Ed, I'd like your input on this. You know, basically, you know, one of the challenges that we talk about in terms of training is how do you get ahead of the curve so that if things like disruptions that happen inside of uh, different businesses, particularly in Ed's, is there a way to get ahead of that so you can train to avoid it or minimize the impact? Ed, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I come right back to the strategic vision. If, if, and, and I think most family businesses, they get together once a week or whatever, and they start the meeting talking about the family issues, and eventually they get into the business. But when they get into the business, they're talking about what's going on today. And mm -hmm. unless you know, unless you're planning for the future, you have no idea what you should be focusing on. So the, the strategic plan should be reviewed on an ongoing basis to make sure that you're doing all the little things that are going to get you where you want to be that are properly stated in your strategic plan. That keeps you focused on the future. And right. that's where you can measure results. You can, you can provide incentives for people that are doing a good job. 
You can bring in talent that you need that you don't have. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get rid of uh, duplicate talent that you don't need anymore. I, I really find it hard to uh, think about how to manage a business if you're focused on the day, only the daily stuff. Yeah, and, right. and if you're owned by a big company, sometimes they got you doing daily stuff and no one's looking at the future. And I think that to, to the business I was in, I think we focused on how to make more, increase the profit margins to insane numbers um, <laughs> in today's world, rather than finding opportunities to reinvest that money into new opportunities of the future. Yeah. And so I think, again, if you want to really, really want to change an organization, I really believe it starts with the strategic plan. Yeah. Yeah. And that particular problem, Ray, um, uh, was kind of one that it's it's what do they call those the black the black black swan. Black swan. I was going to say black goose event. <laughs> yeah, but the black swan event. You know, it's uh, if if you've got your nose buried in um, what's worked for two hundred and some years. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, since Benjamin Franklin was doing placards. You know. Um, I mean, it, literally, that's an old, old a business that's that old. And if that's what you've done always, and you've all, and you've seen, or in some cases, obscene profits. I mean, some of these these old families in the newspaper business just got wealthy beyond belief. And it wasn't because they were geniuses; it's because there were always obscene profits in you know in in the newspaper right. business. And so. Now, all of a sudden, the entire world turns upside down and it's, it's as if somebody banned paper or something. Yeah. Exactly. What do you yeah. do with those presses now? So there's no more paper. We can't. So, I mean, that was the, that's how big that problem was. But you yeah. see, isn't it somebody's responsibility to know enough about the rest of the world to say, maybe there's something changing under our feet here? Um, there are some. Yeah. They had the great opportunity. They were making so much money. They could have taken 20% of what they were making and investing in new types of businesses. Yeah. Right. And, and the other thing that really um, that hurt the newspaper business is that they couldn't work together as a team because they were competing with each other. And a lot of these companies of these delivery companies that are out there right now that are, and there's quite a few of them and they're all making money for the most part. Um, that could have been done by newspapers. Uh, they had the, oh, yeah. the delivery forces in yeah, place. Yeah, infrastructure. That's that's a very good point, Ed. Yeah, and but nobody could uh, work together. They're always competing, so they couldn't come up with any of these ideas. They talked about them, but nobody could deliver because they didn't want to invest in something that was making five percent margin and taking away from their efforts in the newspaper business where they were making perhaps 25% margins. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they they couldn't get out. They just couldn't think outside of their own little world. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what really hurt us. But to me, the greatest way of launching a new business is taking a profitable one, finding a niche that you really like, you know, going through Ron's regimen on marketing, mm -hmm. find right. the right opportunity and take some of your profits and invest it there. And uh, you don't even need to find new money. You can use the money that you already have in, in what you are doing in your existing business. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and, and it's a little bit off the subject, but I, but I think that in what happened is the people who had money started buying other newspapers thinking that they're just going to be adding to their domain. But those other newspapers were ultimately going to fail because the Internet was going to kill them. And, right. um, you know, mean, meanwhile, look at all the uh, organizations that are really prospering online now. I mean, yeah. not, not even talking about Google and, and Facebook and all that. I'm talking talking about the pure news organizations that started off with blogs uh, right. uh, and and uh, um, and now and now have huge staffs and people around the world who they're communicating with and have really pretty professional organizations. So, you know, there was that opportunity too to get into this newer side of things. Um, but you, you, the corporation, when you get that big, the corporation has a tendency to put the people who look at details at the top. The entrepreneur has been dead, you know, for a century. Well, that, that's right. a very good point, Ron. You know, and so right. just maintain it. Just come in here and, you know, 
The only thing that's new and different is the news. And so we're going to do the news, but the way we run the business, that can't change, you know. And right, then right. you run an exactly. expert consultant to say, well, you should spend all your time doing what you do best. Mm -hmm. Focus only on what you do. Well, yeah. if, if that business model doesn't have a future, uh, that is a slow death. That is, yeah, that it's is. like we need to make more buggy whips. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah, buggy whips. And buggy we need whips. to make them cheaper and uh, with higher quality. Right, right. <laughs> and we're going to succeed. <laughs> That's right. So we still have one buggy whip company in the in the in the country. I th I think there's still one left. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. That's right. But uh, getting back to limited. family businesses, I I think family businesses are there's so many out there. There's a lot of them that do very good work. But I think if uh, there is a real opportunity to put in some strategic planning to make them do better. Right. And well, I think that's the, every family business could would benefit from that, which means they probably have to bring in some outside people that can help them through the process. Yeah. And well, it has to, you know, and it, it, the thought occurs to me as you say that, you know, it can't, a family businesses to kind of bring this home, you know, to our subject, family businesses need to not only do you have a, a learning company you got to have a learning family yes they have yep. to be they have to be willing to reach out beyond themselves beyond the industry understand a little bit more about economics and politics and, and a variety of things so that they can make good decisions about what's what is the demand for their current product going to be in 10 years and is is it everything going to be exactly the same, or or are we going to change? Will there are there enough materials um, to to be able to do what they think that they're going to do? Uh, we have had with all of <clears throat> with all of our envisioning that we've had done mostly, I guess, by the government. But um, the the idea that we're going to be able to put say uh, everybody in an EV car. Um, the, the, the planning didn't, you know, the decision was made, but the planning hasn't been there. And so now right. for the first time, dr driving a hundred miles in a, in an electric vehicle costs more in California than driving a hundred miles with a, with a gasoline car. Yeah. No, yeah. I agree. And that is what, something what, I just learned by going through the numbers this last week. I was shocked. Everybody thinks driving an electronic or an electric car is going to save them money. Right. But the rates, uh, the electricity rates are so high and, and there's no control on them in the future. Right. It, it's actually costing more. Where's the incentive right. to make this conversion? Right. Yeah. And so, so, so there's a, there's a case where you have to think that through because literally the materials may not be there. And a, a lot of people are saying that, we're going to have to rip up so much ground to get enough cobalt for the batteries that the the environmentalists will suddenly be awakened again and go be anti mining because they're going to have to take out thousands of acres in in a strip strip mining kind of circumstance and right. so now now you got a real mess so um, you, not only is there change just because like what happened to the internet which didn't have a big huge effect you know, on materials, but it had some. But now when you're talking about energy that has a huge effect on actually being able to get enough materials to do the right thing, boy, this is a changing world that we're in. And if you're a factory, you better be able to have enough enough energy to be able to, you know, you can't you can't really make glass without without natural gas. Yeah, no, I agree. So you know, I would just say one of the things that uh, if I can build on what we were talking about originally is how to develop skills. One of the things that Ed, you you um, you bring up over and over again, it seems to me we we would help we, it would help people to train them how to do a strategic plan to be able to account for some of these things that they don't think about. Uh, and I'd like us to think a little bit about how we might be able to help them develop strategic plans that address issues that are not necessarily thought about. Yeah, no, I think that's a good idea. We've gone through all the mechanics, but we really haven't talked about. So, OK, uh, how do you how do you gray that black swan a little bit by by having yeah. a little bit of knowledge about something that 
you know, might happen, but it did or didn't happen. But that's a good idea. So maybe that's where we can we can continue. To no, uh, yeah, the last thing related to that, you know, Ray and I were involved with one company, what, five years ago, and we started a strategic strategic planning process. And it was like a bomb going off in the building. Uh, it was, uh, we luckily the top person said, okay, we'll give it a shot. But what I found really interesting, we got, came up with phenomenal results from this thing, yeah, exactly. but we also, more importantly, we changed the, the leadership of the company to be more open to new ideas and, uh, different ways of evaluating performance out in the, on, on the shop floor. Mm-hmm. And uh, really made a difference in that company. And I, I'm shocked. There, what it is today compared to five years ago is like night and day. Yeah. And yeah. they're and they're really they're taking the strategic planning to the next level. Now they're getting into valuations, they're getting into a lot of new ideas that five years ago they would have thrown Ray out and myself <laughs> yeah. on the on the doorstep because they didn't want to hear it. Yeah. Some of those things take take a lot of time. And maybe when we get into that, we can talk more about it. But I've, I'm just reminded that uh, a lot of the planning that I did um, almost 10 years ago for a school system, um, uh, we, we took a long time. Uh, it, it took four years to plan <clears throat> a merger. And then it took five years to execute the merger. But uh, the the result has been such an incredibly strong organization that is you know serving like fourteen hundred families today as opposed to three four hundred you know when I started the plan. So I mean yeah. you know when you see a three time multiple like that and you see you see how things can happen, you become a believer, um, and it's a it's a very forward looking kind of what's going to be what's the world going to be like down the road. And at the same time, it's very disciplined because it takes a lot of detail work for a long time. Persistence is really important in these right. kind of plans. I think that's what a lot of entrepreneurs are lacking. Um, but if families were to take a look at a long-term family wealth plan, which the financial people are pushing a lot now, intergenerational wealth is what the rich people look at. Well, right. they're rich for a reason. Maybe that's because they think intergenerationally. Um, some long-term stuff is important, so that's a good idea to continue on. And let's 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 think of some good good additional subjects. So, well, this has been a great discussion. Um, unless one of you have like a final comment, I think we can wrap it up and and uh, we'll we'll chat some more about the next subject. Well, I yeah. think you've done a great job laying this out, Ron, and uh, it was a real pleasure to um, be to engage in this process uh, following your your methodology. I thought you hit it right on the head. Oh, well, thank you. you of course, you, you guys always fill in the gaps and make me look good. Appreciate that. We'll see you all next time. <laughs>